Fine. Testing one, two, three, four. No. Hello, Mukta. Welcome. Kirish Daiva, good to see you. Ajish, welcome. Hi, Jent, good to see you. Michael, good to see you. Well, welcome. So, so let's start, I think. Uh, Asis, uh, you are ready? Yeah, Rupesh, no problems. Anytime. Yeah, so let's start. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rupesh. I'm the head BD India for the Association of Proposal Management Professionals, APNP. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the APNP India monthly webinar series. Today, we are pleased to present the topic, the future of the bid and proposal writing profession rising to the challenge. So before I turn things over to our presenter, uh, Mr. Vasudev Murthy, uh, let me uh, tell you that today's session is being recorded and uh, also live stream on YouTube as well. And our link to the recording will be emailed to the all resistance a few hours after the presentation is over. Or else you can always go and watch on our APNP India YouTube uh, channel as well. So throughout today's presentation, you are welcome to submit your questions as you think of them. So please check out the Zoom control panel where you will find the questions pen. So make sure that you put your question into the Q&A uh, section, Q&A panel. And you can type your questions there at any time during the presentation. And we will address them towards the end of the program. Uh, so that's it. All right. I think we are ready to go now. So I'll turn things over to our presenter, Mr. Mr. Vasudev Murthy, who is our co-chair for APNP India Governing Board. Over to you, Vasudev. Thank you very much. Uh, Rupesh, uh, very nice of you to introduce. Yeah, here we go. So recording has started. So um, again, uh, welcome to everyone to this you know, the fantastic show that we're going to have today, I'm sure. Uh, we, are ha we, are, we propose to have a series of webinars uh, you know, involving distinguished professionals in the bid and proposal management uh, area. Uh, and of course, we have actually a variety of other programs coming up in the, in the, in the several several weeks uh, you know, going forward. Um, so I look forward to your attending these programs. We have these tight but compact and heavily informative uh, activities uh, from now on. Uh, in our first webinar, uh, we will be taking a look, as Rupesh said, at the evolution uh, of this field. So specifically, we have the title is The Future of the Bid and Proposal uh, Profession and Rising to the Challenge. So what does it mean, rising to the challenge in the sense of is something happening that we should be aware of and are we all actually prepared as a community of professionals to, to do something about it, right? So I have with me today uh, two um, absolutely distinguished uh, professionals. I have the privilege of knowing them. Uh, the first is Sam Singh, who's a leader at Shipley, uh, which many of you know is uh, works in the area of uh, bid and proposal uh, writing, the training. And uh, though he has a formal write-up, uh, which I will just read out, his passion is seeing people succeed by upping their game. He has witnessed firsthand the lives of our unsung heroes. That's beautiful burning the midnight oil, and would like to see bid and proposal professionals get to work in bid nirvana. So uh, that's very nice of you, Sam. I appreciate the very uh, generous sentiment. And I know Sam now for years and years and years, and we've always had a great time. So you can expect uh, lots of fun today. He has a great sense of humor, and we would like that because as Mr. Ragnarton said, we really ought to, you know, of course, take, it, take this very seriously, but we should have the ability to have a good time as well. So again, Sam, welcome. I look forward to your participation. Uh, the second person I'd like to I'd like to, to introduce, it's my privilege, is Ashish Bhatia, right? Um, uh, till recently, he was with a different company, but today he's in, in the India Center head for DXC Technologies, Global Solutioning Services. So that's, uh, you know, obviously must be the thick of proposal writing in a very big way is my uh, shrewd guess, 
right? And um, Ashish has a lot of cross-functional experiences developing solutions across IT infrastructure, cloud analytics, IoT, et cetera. And as far as verticals are concerned, he's worked in communications, media, financial services, pharmacy, et cetera. So I think, you know, we have two heavyweights over here, if I may say so. So Ashish, welcome. So uh, let me let me begin. Uh, yeah, let me let me do first of all. Uh, uh, let me just quickly say how this will pan out. I have a number of questions which I will be asking uh, our panelists. Um, I think the discussion will probably take about forty minutes, right? Uh, during which you will listen. You, uh, I'm talking to the audience now. You may have several questions. Please put them in the Q and A box as Rupesh so kindly suggested. Uh, subsequently, uh, he will choose a few questions and pass them on to me. So we hope to finish uh, about 3.55 or, um, or uh, sorry, uh, 4.55 or 5 o'clock at, at, at the latest. I hope that works. A quick sound check. If there's anyone here having difficulty with sound, could you please inform Rupesh immediately so that we can do something about it? I'm not sure. Okay. Right. So, um, so Sam, let me start with you. Okay. This is, we will we'll build up the pace. I have a a nice selection of six or seven BT questions for the two of you. Um, and let's go back to fun certain fundamentals, okay? Uh, so let me ask you this direct question. When did proposal writing become a formal activity requiring specialized skills? But before you answer, I'd like to say that, you know, a lot of us, uh, and I think I will, I will, I'm no exception, we went into proposal writing and bid management, perhaps due to fate, destiny, circumstances, whatever the case may be. And now we enjoy ourselves, of course, over there. But clearly there was a time, there has been a transition. The very fact that all of us are here and, you know, at this watering hole, so to say, shows that, you know, we have come of age in a, man in a manner of speaking. So would you like to tell us a little bit uh, in, in, in retrospect, you know, when did this become a formal activity that needed a specialized, a person with specialized skills rather than somebody, someone at the water fountain who happened to be free? Would you like to take that? Ashish, why don't you go first? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, when it comes to the history around uh, bid and proposal management writing, I think Sam uh, obviously would bring in more to the table. But uh, my two cents are that uh, it, it started more with uh, the government side of the world rather than the enterprise uh, or the commercial uh, side of the world itself. Um, and governments have had this uh, tendency since ages uh, to have multiple bids in, uh, find the lowest bidder. And uh, that perhaps started age, ages back, uh, more so in uh, developed countries like the US and the UK, um, where, where government contracts are still handed out based upon uh, lowest price, right? And so is it in India as well, rather than 100% uh, competencies itself. And that perhaps has really evolved into in the commercial side of the world as well and into a formal uh, writing process. Obviously, uh, it, it picked up uh, steam when the uh, IT services uh, start, started uh, becoming more global in nature as well. Uh, that was during the 90s, uh, 1990s. And then subsequently, uh, this role started to develop. Uh, whereas uh, <clears throat> we, we can really see that the IT side of the world is what we generally speak about, but there are other sides of the world as well. For example, supply chain management or manufacturing, where these kind of activities have been prevalent since many more years uh, than what we think uh, they are. I IT is uh, the the post poster child of at least for the for the Indian uh, industry, but on the other side, the other verticals as well have had their fair share of. Uh, written proposal management as well. Sam? Thank you. When I think of the history of bids and proposals, I think of the Basanti dialogue. Baithe, baithe, nahi baithe, nahi baithe. Right? So mm -hmm. can you imagine two industrialists, uh, no, two people sitting in New York, having a coffee and doing a deal and say, we're going to do this project. And then they say, how do we get away with it? Actually, I can't award it to you. There's some kind of probity. Tell you what, let's go get one or two other companies to give us uh, give us that so we can just run a comparison, right? The deal's already done. 
And suddenly they go and get all these people with ancient typewriters and they're typing away QWERTR and starting writing a proposal, but the deal's already done. And even today, the biggest thing about proposals is somebody's already the front runner. And coming back to the serious question, it's really in the last 30 years that we see that it's become formal because proposal is not only about submission. Bid to submit is one thing. Bid to win is a completely different ballgame. But, but Sam, the, 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 again, I, I mean, what happened? When did this inflection point occur that, you know, suddenly you realized that you needed people with specialized writing skills, with a perspective on business, etc.? Because I think, and I'm going back to my own career, etc., I, I think I do remember that, frankly, we were just guys who happened to be available and said, can you help us write a proposal? I think nobody really had a science and system around the whole thing. Right. So, uh, of course, the today's topic is about the future, but still, it's good to have a re retrospect about what happened. But was it the formation of APMP, for example? I'm just just throwing it out as, as a possibility that said, this is the point. You know, we really need to get get our act together and make things a little more formal. Do you do you remember such a time? So, well, of course, before before my time in working, but if we look back, roughly about 50 years ago, uh, lots of things started to get formal. And there was a guy who was our original founder, a gentleman by the name of Richard Shipley. Mm -hmm. He was a writer. Mm -hmm. And he said, there is nothing on business writing. So he put a team together and they only specialized in business writing. And then his cousin came along, Steve Shipley, who became the, the, the founder of Shipley as it is today. And then they said, you know, there, ha there has to be a whole art around it and a whole strategy around and what he increasingly saw is the federal government was putting formal proposals that bidders had to bid for. And so that kind of started. And then roughly about 30 years ago, Steve said, there's no industry body. And that's when a number of them in the US came up with the idea of the National Association of Proposal Managers. And they set it up as a kind of not-for-profit body, Shipley and many of the of the competitors and people who had a passion. And then they realized that that national association is only US. So to make it formal, it should become an APMP or something like that. And so the name was then changed into APMP. And then that's how the APMP started to look at the sort of bringing professionalism into the industry. So I would say the journey, at least you know, my knowledge, uh, and I'm not saying my knowledge is right, is 50 years. On, on a lighter note, Vasu, uh, the inflection point was when the sales guys realized that uh, the proposals that they were putting out couldn't win them business and they needed to. <laughs> okay. That, that, that's <laughs> touché, <possible>. touché. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, in that case, I'm going to catch you because you're the, you're the solutions guy, as far as I can see, the two of you, because you spent a tremendous amount of time in IT uh, activities, right? Uh, there used to be this uh, whole uh, creative tension between the you know proposal writers and the solutions guys okay i remember this for my time at wipro where, we, where i tried to put together a proposal uh, writing team we specialized in that and to be perfectly honest there was some amount of resistance to put it mildly and they said you know why would they do they don't know anything about solutions and so on and so forth but clearly things had changed at least in, in medium size to large size company that we realized we need specialized skill so in your journey as a proposal writer, manager, bid manager, et cetera, what have you observed in the way, you know, this has been, this has changed. The proposal writing has changed the way it's been accepted in companies. Like, for example, where you are DXC and where you were earlier. So um, in, in my career, and I'll uh, just, just take probably the last 15 years or so where I've been uh, really into proposal writing itself. Interesting point, I moved over from sales into pre-sales. Vasu. So since you're talking about how do people move into this, uh, the uh, at an earlier point of time, there wasn't any differentiation between bid managers, proposal managers, and solution managers. Uh, when I started my career, and if I look back, I don't remember whether, whether I was a bid manager, proposal manager, or a solution manager. I think I was all, and so were all of my colleagues in that particular team as well. Uh, so at that point of time, the differentiation really wasn't there. Of course, there were specialized solution teams. They always have been, they always were uh, of uh, 
specialized skills, which probably one individual really couldn't uh, have that kind of breadth as well as the depth that would be required to uh, respond to a particular proposal, right? So um, I've seen roles that have been uh, uh, rolled into one. And as time continued, these roles got split across. Uh, slowly but surely, the kind of um, expertise that was required or the kind of uh, uh, specialization that was required started to grow more intensive. So perhaps as a first stage, the bid and proposal management became a separate function and rightly so, uh, solutioning became a, a separate function uh, as well, right? And over a period of time, in fact, the bid and proposal management in some ways is uh, going back to where it came from, though in a different avatar, and Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously this is biased towards IT as well, uh, is we are looking at specialist bid and proposal management writers, where we are once again saying, uh, obviously coming in from the IT perspective, is that we want bid and proposal management uh, uh, professionals uh, who have, for example, spent time and have experience either in a particular vertical like uh, pharma or manufacturing, where they're supposed to know the domain, where they're supposed to know the processes, uh, or if it's from the technology perspective, we, we need professionals uh, who are more experts in cloud, as an example, uh, or now what I'm seeing the trend that a bid manager for cloud isn't enough. They may need a bid manager for Azure cloud, right? And then I'm seeing bid manager for Azure cloud migrations. Okay, so uh, it's it's come around to that where I guess we're going back to where we started from in some way where they need one person to really own the solution or at least provide a reasonable amount of control and feedback uh, and quality of the response itself, right? That's what I'm looking for. So in a sense, if you're just looking at bid and proposal management uh, to be just uh, project managing uh, or coordinating a particular bid, I think we are beyond that point now. And if we still live in the illusion that we'll just do coordination and uh, project management of a particular bit that comes in, then uh, we are really uh, looking at our uh, own end. In fact, it's, it will be the beginning of the end if we just look at that. Sam? Um, thanks very much, Ashish. I guess if we look at it from the customer's point of view, never has the customer had so much choice. In the India we grew up, you know, you wait for seven years for a Vespa scooter. And if you were a car, there was only two choices to buy a car, Ambassador or, or Fiat, and then wait for a seven-year waiting list. But then everyone had to up their game, and these brands have disappeared. And so we look at the same in every industry. The customer has so much choices. And if the customer has so much choices, then the bidders have got to fight harder to get that business. The Fiat car guy didn't have to work hard, only his Fiat or ambassador. And Fiat had kind of an Italian angle to it. Whereas today, every bidder, every car dealer has to fight for that customer. So if, if we look at this, you know, and again, looking at movie analogy, um, we have to see that not all script writers will make a good actor and vice versa. And so the same way now, if we think of bids and proposals, would be great to hire people who've done BA in journalism or BA in English literature, because the solution folks are saying, what do you have to do to solve this problem? And the proposal writers really need to say, what do you need to do to select us to solve your problem? And that's the subtle difference between the solution and the persuasion angle. A fabulous insights. Uh, uh, you know, so something that Ashish that you mentioned was, you know, uh, going back to the original fairly primitive time, and Samuel, you you resonate with this as well. I do remember a specific instance, uh, you know, when I was in Deloitte in Dallas uh, several years ago, where writing a proposal was basically just an outsourcing of sections to different people, and I, I think you just said coordination. So you know, it was like you write the section, you write the section, and and the thing would come together as this mishmash pulao. Uh, which was which passed off as a proposal, which is of course today in today's world none of us would find that acceptable. It doesn't make sense sense at all. 
And the second point that you made, I think most critically, which I will actually come to is the rising expectation of various people, as you said, for very specialized skills. So you can't uh, you know, just be a guy who writes well, which is unfortunately or fortunately a requisite. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, you need, need to be a person who writes and knows technology and knows business and is a basically a super superman. Uh, that's that I think is uh, that's actually a complement to the professionalism of uh, of bid uh, bid proposal management today. That you know you need to have this great width and be able to handle technology. And I, I say this from uh, and I, I think it's okay to mention this, but in the context of a certain large company in Hyderabad, the name starts with M. Some of you may know that. Uh, we we observed the proposal writers had to work with a large number of different technologies and had to be well, if not fluent, they at least had to have a possible conversation with the so subject matter experts to be able to be seen as credible people. So I don't know, Ashish, what do you think of that? But I think there is this expectation that proposal writers, apart from being suave, intelligent, brilliant at communication, et cetera, should also have at least a simple layer, or at least in some level of knowledge of the solution language. Is that true? No, that's true because as I was mentioning, right, uh, what the expectation from solution writers or bid and proposal management uh, professionals is that you will get a fully reviewed solution back, right? Uh, and that essentially means uh, from a solution perspective as also from a financial or a commercial perspective as well. Uh, so it, it's like uh, the, the sales team Hopefully, they have a role to play. Most salespeople do understand what their role in the entire uh, solution development or the bid response is. And I hope uh, the sales community works closely with the bid and proposal management community in doing that. But in all essence, the solution team is expected to be the outsourced arm, if I may say so, uh, for lack of a better term, for that particular project that needs to be taken up and they need a fully baked uh, project solution. I'm not talking about the bid and response. I'm talking about the, the, the program itself. Uh, back to them, right? So what that essentially means is that the solution that goes for reviews should have already been reviewed before it goes for, for one, right? Whether it goes to the delivery team or whether it goes to the uh, solution architects, there should be some amount of logic, sanity, and correct solutioning embedded in it before it goes there. So yes, as you mentioned, it's, it's um, the expectation is really high from this particular team that they should be an all-in-one uh, encompassing team. So I'm going to come to the next provocative question on this address to both of you. But before I do that, let me just uh, extend a welcome to everyone who's probably come a little later than four o'clock. All of you are listening in to a, a nice little talk that we're having, fireside talk perhaps, or whatever you want to call it, with the two brilliant professionals, Sam Singh of Shipley and Ashish Bhatia of DXC. And we're discussing the evolution of uh, the proposal, uh, bid and proposal writing profession and figuring out whether you know we are really ready for the challenges of the future and what are the challenges. So that's what we are talking about. So you're all most welcome uh, over here. And while I have your attention, don't forget to uh, you know subscribe to our YouTube channel, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, everywhere you can see APNP India, please go ahead and uh, you know join us, join the community. We are a nice, vibrant, friendly community and we'd like you to be a part of it. So with that, let me move on to the next question um, because you know we have said a lot now and uh, things are getting warm uh, so sam this is addressed to you and i, I would expect ashish also to butt in we have seen uh, uh, you know ashish talk a lot about uh, about that expectations going up and sky high and no longer can the proposal writing community be um, well support or you know nice guys sitting in a corner it's not that so now the question here is is this a support function or or something strategic and mainstream? How is it positioned in organizations today and how will it be positioned in organizations today? Tomorrow, perhaps. So That's a great, great question. So on a lighthearted note, I don't know if anyone saw that movie some years ago. For the life of me, I can't remember that name of the movie where the Jamaican country had a bobsleigh team, right? And bobsleigh is played in the cold countries. 
So these yep. Jamaican guys, you know, in a tropical climate with no snow, decided that they're going to go for bobsleigh. And in the Winter Olympics this year, many tropical countries are playing and they've got a bobsleigh team. Now, initially, we would have all laughed and said, you know, how is it possible? But they had passion, they had desire, they had motivation, they got a coach. And I guess the same thing comes finally in winning. Is, is, is if as a bidder, I want to win, then I have to overcome all the impediments that makes me win, right? And so internally, the winning starts in the mind. At the kickoff call, everyone's got to visualize that win and the champagne bottle being opened and everyone's visualizing that win. And so that's the kind of analogy I would say is, you know, winning is mission critical. You know, the bobsleigh team from Jamaica said, we're just going in for a laugh, right? Then, then nobody would have taken them seriously. In fact, nobody did take them seriously initially. But ultimately, they got in and they actually got somewhere. And then the next one, they got busy. So I think the same way with, with business winning or, or bids and proposals, it's no longer a necessary evil. That's what separates the winners from the bidders. So, uh, Ashish, would you like to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, ab absolutely, and and ab uh, hundred percent concur with uh, Sam. See, see, the the point is, Vasu, the the organizations in which bid and proposal management is not seen as a back end activity are the ones who really I don't have empirical data to prove that, but at least my experience says so. Have a higher probability of winning a particular deal, where as compared to organizations which relegate them to the back end to an operational level. Uh, what we should understand and recognize is that bid and proposal managers do require interactions with the client. And I don't mean the internal clients in this case, I mean the external client itself. During an opportunity, a tendering process, an RFP, an engagement, there are multiple touch points with the client. And I believe that the bid and proposal management community is uniquely positioned in order to ask the right questions to the client in order to respond more logically and more correctly to a particular bid, right? And if that opportunity is not given to them, uh, they would uh, not perform at their optimal level. Uh, from an anecdote perspective, it's more of a real life experience rather than an anecdote. When I was in pre-sales, uh, I was always told by the sales teams that, oh, and this is literally my experience, that you cannot ask any further questions or you cannot ask questions. The client will be upset. The client will not respond. Uh, the date is passed. Oh, obviously, there are, there are some very uh, uh, clients who stick to the dates itself. But in most cases, and I realized this once I moved to sales, uh, is the fact that, yes, I moved from sales to pre-sales to sales to pre-sales, right? So in, in, in most cases, I wouldn't even say most cases, in all cases where I interact with, with the clients, no client refused to answer a question which would give them a better output or a solution, right? So the entire myth about you cannot ask a question, it is a back-end question, make do with the information that you had have make suitable assumptions and keep on building the assumptions in an appendix and make it 32 pages, mm. uh, not really, right? So uh, that's the point. If it is not relegated to be a backend activity, the probability of winning is higher. Fantastic, Sam and Ashish. I think both of you have actually, um, you know, somehow highlighted an important lesson which I want to convey to the younger members of the, of, uh, who, attended this, uh, who attended the webinar. Namely, you know, the, the self-confidence to be able to ask questions and not be order takers. I don't know if I'm being crude here, Ashish, but, you know, if, our, if proposal managers or writers think that they're just order takers and we'll just do what we are going to be doing, well, that's unfortunate because, indeed, you have more power than you think you have, you know, because you have, you have the width. Sam, uh, help me out here. I hope I'm not uh, talking nonsense, but basically... The vantage point of proposal and bid managers is that they're actually able to see a lot more 
it, because they talk to so many other clients, they have seen solutions and proposals being developed. Sometimes a salesperson is too close to the client to be able to actually see the larger picture. I don't know if, if, if Ashish, you agree with me. So therefore, I think, you know, we all need to realize that there are, you actually have power. And if you don't exercise that power, you know, that would be unfortunate. So you are actually, and if I can then therefore say that I think, this is my view, bid and proposal writing ought to be considered a strategic part of every, any organization. Sam, are you with me then? Totally. Yeah. Good. So on, on these lines, now let's let's shift gears a little bit, uh, Ashish and Sam, and I want to talk about how things will evolve in the future. You know, there was this uh, thing I had once participated in, and the whole thing about automation, let's automate this, let's let's use AI, let's, you know, do all these kinds of things. Now, I don't know if those are, those are threats or whether there are actually, uh, you know, things happening. Um, so are we, uh, what is happening on the ground there in terms of what what is what is going on with for proposal writers to be aware of? Now, before before you answer the question, I also want to point out, Ashi had mentioned about 10 minutes ago that, you know, and we had agreed, I think violently agreed, that a proposal writer is not just a writer. He actually is ahead. He needs to learn a little bit of technology, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, what is going to happen in the future with regard to this whole profession of proposal writing? Can any of you throw some grounds in the sense of expectations of stakeholders? What are they expecting now? Earlier, we had unreasonable expectations. Here's, you know, use this information, write a proposal by tomorrow. That has become better now. People can be reasoned with, they give you a week, a month sometimes. But now we talk about automation. So are things going to change again? We say, you know, just drive it through, give me an executive summary by tomorrow. So what's happening with that kind of churn? Can either of you talk about that? Ashish, why don't you go first? Sure, Sam. So, uh, Vasu, my, my two cents on this really would be that, yes, there are automation-based uh, or AI-based tools that are coming into the play. Uh, are they good enough? They are getting better. Uh, and will they uh, make a change? They probably will make an impact, if not yeah. now, in, in a few years from now. It would be naive to be ignorant to uh, new technologies that are coming in they are not just going to affect the bid and proposal management community, but pretty much each and every job out there in the world, if not in the zero, next zero to five years, but probably in the next uh, five to 10 years. So, so that's, the, that's the base. Uh, at this point of time, the premise of these tools is based upon the fact that the proposal, the next proposal that goes out is based upon historical data. Uh, and once again, we've seen uh, with any automation or AI tool, whether it's in the bit or proposal management community or whether it's on the technology side of the world, is that it all depends upon the available data, garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, so all of these tools are based upon the existing reusable components, which is the favorite word of all bid and proposal management community professionals, uh, is that it's based upon the reusable components that are already existing. Right. It probably searches for keywords. It does some analysis on its own, and then it tries to develop a proposal. But it still belongs to the premise that uh, you can reuse a particular component and you can reuse data from previous engagements or builds and then send it out to the next customer. I hope and believe that they don't forget to change the customer name like many of us have done in the past. If anybody on the chat has not ever in their life sent out a proposal with the previous customer's name, please put your hands up. Maybe Vasu will have a special prize uh, for you all. But uh, that's what the premise of those tools really are. But that doesn't address the customizable customizable part of the solution itself, the one that the customer has really asked for, right? Uh, and it also uh, takes away, how do I say it, right? It, it, it's like a handmade purse versus uh, something made by uh, something made by a machine, right? Uh, that's, that's pretty much the difference, the kind of customization or the kind of input that goes into it. Sam? Thank you. So if we look at technology and AI, let's just break it into three key three, three, three areas. Uh, as Ashish mentioned, let's start with the back end and the content. To be fair, it's only very few organizations that have cracked it. 
in I would say ninety five percent of the organizations, it's on the to do list. It's on Sam, the to do list. We may have a separate webinar on that particular topic itself. Sorry, it's sorry topic. for jumping in. Sorry. No, you're absolutely right. So I think that's the number one. It's always on the to do list, which means if you take the kind of library content, if that's not right, then think of a middle kind of content which brings things from the library. Okay. And then you look at the far end, which is presenting the content to the customer. And those three pieces is where till today, there is no one technology that can do all those three things. There are some things on the front end. You can get some really beautiful software, which is web-based, cloud-based, where the presentation aspect is brilliant, but that still has to pull the data from somewhere. And that middle piece data is where you have to, if you like, repurpose, manipulate, rewrite, whatever you want to call it, from the reference data. So yet that technology is not there where those, those three components are brought in. So there is this um, gap then, you know, the outside world is changing rapidly in terms of technology solutions. Everyone's making some great statements about that AI, uh, you know, whatever. There's so much stuff happening, but but we are, we are also admitting rather with some amount of embarrassment that our proposal writing community in terms of tools and techniques and so on hasn't moved fast enough. Is that too strong a statement? I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if it's not moved fast enough. Uh, I, I think we all also, uh, our community gave birth to other uh, professions as well, like knowledge manager and asset manager as well. So uh, some of the knowledge and asset managers may thank us for doing an incompetent job, which really uh, gave birth to their profession as well. <laughs> but uh, at the same point of time, uh, the knowledge managers and the asset managers really uh, uh, do form part of the extended bid and proposal management community itself. And all of us collectively had to pretty much bump, bump, our, bump up our act. Um, I think uh, Sam was being uh, pretty uh, um, uh, generous when he said 95% of it have it on their to-do list. <laughs> I would dare not say 95. I might go a few percentage points up from that, or even if they've done it, uh, it th there's no end to it, right? You always keep doing more and more uh, of it. It's it's a, it's a, always a never ending job. So whether we've done a job or not, uh, I, that that's out for the jury. Uh, but but on, honestly speaking, uh, yes, we could do better in most cases. Okay, thanks for the diplomatic response, Ashish. So let's let's do some crystal ball gazing a little bit. Now we've, we've talked about the past, we've talked about the present, uh, you know, what kind of challenges we have. And there are a whole lot of young uh, propo uh, proposal writing professionals online, and we're happy to have them there. Uh, let's do some prediction, if we can, of what's going to happen in the way a typical proposal will be solicited and created and submitted or let's say or maybe in the year 2030, 20, 2032 perhaps. What's going to change in your opinion about the whole thing, whether it's a business, whether it's technology, modes of submission, skills required, what have you? So Sam, would you like to take that? Well, I, hopefully I would have retired by then. So it's a bit difficult to predict what could be there in the future. But I guess, you know, if, if going... <coughs> Excuse me, if going at, at but past performance is anything to say there, it, it really asks the key question about selecting a partner or a vendor. How much is that selection process going to be automated? And today what we've seen is there's a lot done in simplifying it. So a lot of submission is done through portals. There's a lot of evaluation. But really it's, it's that buying process till that changes you know, everything else is in a supply chain of that buying process. You know, I could have all the artificial intelligence technology in the world, but if I don't meet the selection criteria, it's of no use. I have to crank it by hand. So it, it's really you have to start at that front end of that whole selection process, selection criteria. How does that become? And then the other thing comes in. Is it fair? How will that be fair? Is it biased towards somebody? And it's really from there a lot starts to flow down downstream. Ashish. So Ashish, before you answer that, I have I want to make one point to Sam's thing about you know the buying process. 
In fact, Sam, uh, there's been a debate going on in a different uh, context about uh, soliciting and submitting proposals through blockchain. Weird as it may sound. Okay, uh, sounds really futuristic, science, uh, science fiction, God alone knows, but for sake of transparency and security and all that hoo-ha that we talk about from blockchain, it has been talked about. So, you know, just, just a side note that things can change drastically, uh, you know, over here uh, in terms of amazing technology. So, Ashish, on those lines, uh, you know, anything to add to what I said and what, uh, what Sam said? So, Vasu, that means if you use blockchain, does it mean no more copy-pasting? I don't know. <laughs> what a tragedy. <laughs> so that that would be a bad one. And and then as as Apoor said in the chat window as well, we'll have to reinvent ourselves. But uh, how we uh, if you if you really would want me to um, crystal ball gaze, think out of the box, Vasu, if that's the question, then probably uh, what I would think 10, 10 years down the line, if not earlier, there, there would be something like a marketplace uh, out there where uh, one really wouldn't have the bid and proposal management community at the core itself, but specialized professionals at the core. And Sam was 100% on the ball when he mentioned that the requirement is, um, or the way that we should really look at it is from the buyer perspective rather than the supplier side of it. Uh, so the buyer would have even more choice than uh, she has today. Uh, there would be a marketplace available. There would be self-service portals available. Uh, the solutions would probably be readily deployable. And yes, I am biased towards the IT side of the bid management itself. I don't know how it would work and perhaps manufacturing, right? Where, um, But um, I, if, if I think of it, it would be, pretty similar to replicate on the manufacturing side of the world if somebody needs a nut and bolt of a particular breadth and width and particular weight and uh, of some, some metal being made, uh, they could also replicate the same thing uh, as if somebody wants a AWS uh, uh, instance to be spun up, right? So for many of these things, as we've seen with the uh, cloud itself evolving, uh, you, you remember you were in Wipro as well. The customers used to have, a, and Sam mentioned this, customers used to have a three-month waiting period before they used to get a server into their data centers, right? Now it's three minutes away. It's not even three months away. It's three, min three minutes away at this point of time. And those have become a self, uh, what do you call it? Nobody needs to put out a RFP for that at this point of time. And that would increase uh, to more domains and more levels as we go out, uh, as we move from more bespoke solutions to more SaaS-based solutions as well. Uh, the propensity of um, self-service portals or a marketplace uh, might really increase for the buyer. And that's what I really see happening down the line. Very insightful. You know, I, I wonder how many of these things will actually develop, but things will change for sure. And we've all seen that happening. So, uh, by the way, so uh, before I come to my last and final question, again, I want to you know, uh, welcome some of you who have gone a bit late. We're having this fantastic webinar on, on the, how things are be developing in the bill proposal industry. We're trying to understand what the future will look like. I would like you to all to take a look at some of the wonderful questions and comments coming in on the chat uh, on chat window here. There's a nice uh, you know, observation from, uh, from the chairperson of APNP in there where he says, Critical thinking, problem solving, and creative articulation will be the skills that managers need to stay relevant. Uh, very insightful, Abhijit. Uh, much appreciate that comment. And there's several more which we will take. Uh, so uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this quite blatantly. Please go ahead and make sure that on LinkedIn, you guys follow APNP India. We're going to have lots of fun stuff happening. So do that. Follow our YouTube channel, Instagram. We're going to have some crazy stuff happening there because believe it or not, bid and proposal uh, writers and managers are really fun guys. We are... You know, we are always at beer parties and having a great time. So we actually like that. I'm sure all of you agree. Okay. So with that, uh, I have, uh, I think we should really move to move to a slightly more mentoring kind of a question. I'd like to, I'd like to say that. Okay. So Ashish, let me address this to you and then Sam, uh, uh, we'll move to you. Is there a message that you would like to give, you know, uh, to aspiring proposal writers? Now, let me preface that by saying that, you know, uh, 
at one point of time, it used to be difficult to get people to take up a career in proposal writing. I think you'll all agree. But that time has actually changed. Uh, some years ago, I remember we had uh, interviewed uh, probably 30 or 40 proposal writers for about four positions, which was a dream situation. Now, dream in the sense that, you know, we have, we were spoiled for choices. That has changed. Earlier, it was very difficult to get someone to actually write, sit down and say, I like to do proposal writing full time, right? Now, I think it is quite, it ought to be considered an aspirational kind of a career to be a proposal writer, because if you're smart, you realize you have a strategic view of the entire organization that actually no one else does. The sales guy doesn't have it. The marketing guys doesn't have it. You guys are proposal writers have it. So you don't know what you have in the sense that, you know, you have, you're sitting on top of great treasure and wisdom. So uh, with that, Ashish, what kind of advice would you like to uh, give to an aspiring proposal writer? Well, on the lighter side, all, all the smart kids nowadays want to become Python programmers because that's where they see the money is. But uh, on, on a more serious note, I, I would send out a couple of uh, messages to aspiring bid and proposal professionals. Uh, one is what uh, Abhijit mentioned, and I can't see that particular comment on my window at this point of time, but as you mentioned, critical thinking uh, needs to be the most important part of it. The second part is, uh, it is what you make out of it, uh, the the particular profession. Uh, if you would want, even, even in a proactive team, you can still be relegated to the back end and still be an operational person, just taking in inputs, processing those inputs itself. It's the kind of commitment that you would want to put into that particular role that really differentiates one proposal manager from the other proposal manager where you actually put yourself into the shoes of the buyer, of actually not even the buyer, the buyer could be different, right? And once again, Sam, uh, Sam can, uh, elaborate on that on some other day on some other topic but uh, put yourself into the shoes of the user of how that particular solution is going to be used eventually uh, if one fails to do that then the basic premise of being a proposal a bid manager a solution manager what you call it would fall flat on on its feet right based right so uh, one is um, what Abhijit mentioned, do the critical thinking part of it. Uh, the second part is put yourself into the uh, shoes of the user. Third thing is keep yourself updated, right? Not just with the technology, but also with how the marketplace is evolving. Uh, you may choose a particular area to go deep, Right. The, the beauty about this, Paso, and even uh, you could chime in as well, is the fact that one needs to go deep into a particular topic as well as wide. Right. There are very few careers who give you that opportunity to do that. Uh, if you're a technology professional as well, one tends to go really deep into a particular technology and not not necessarily, right? Not necessarily go wide, but in a bit management kind of a role, one needs to go deep as well as wide, right? So those are the three takeaways I, I would have. Sam? Thank you very much. Very insightful. Sam, over to you. So winning is a team sport. So, you know, it's not a hero culture. The team has to win or lose. And really, if you think about uh, if we're aspiring in this profession, there are three things I would say to all bidding um budding not bidding i'm getting my words confused here bid always is on my mind but to budding professionals there are three things number one is be of the mindset that you've got to invest in yourself and the investment in yourself is do your own homework you know learn from things keep continuously improving your skills your knowledge don't wait for the organization to have a personal development plan have your own personal development plan Second is believe in yourself. And in order to believe in yourself, find yourself a mentor, a colleague, you know, who's, who really can help you reach your potential. And third is get professionally qualified because that really says that I meet a standard. You know, it could be like, you know, on, I meet a certain standard and that says, you know, you've taken your profession seriously. And the single biggest closure is learn to have fun. 
bidding proposals about fun. Yeah, we you know we are party animals. Everybody knows that. So thanks a lot for reminding. And, and reminding most of you. the most of the responses are created at the places that you just. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. At least well, the was, pricing is. I don't know about this. <laughs> That was fun. So let's do this. Um, I think we've had a lot of fun. So gentlemen, I'm really grateful to both of you. Let's see, you know, I'm sure we have a few questions and I'm going to let Rupesh uh, select those questions and put it across. Rupesh, why don't you go ahead and no problem. Go ahead and please, um, you know, read out the questions. It's perfectly fine if you're able to read yeah. out. A, they take yeah. a maximum of three questions in the interest of time. So please select whatever makes sense. Yeah. So there is an interesting question. Uh, it came from Deloitte. He said that, hi, what's the difference between bid management and proposal management? We'll put that to Sam, <laughs> <laughs> even, even before there is a choice. Thanks, Ashish. So think of bid management as all the things you need to do to win, right? And think of the bid manager as a bid entrepreneur. You know, what's the commercial deal we need? What's the internal sign-off we need? What's the competition? And, you know, so look at all the things that need to be done to win and the bid manager, in effect, is the program manager or program director for all the things that need to be done to win. And the proposal manager is about the document. I'm just using the word document. It could be whatever format. It's about the proposal that goes out. Great. So uh, this is next question. Yeah. So next question is from uh, Sikhar Saxena. So that, uh, his question is that the expectation from a solution architect and a bid manager are very similar now in IT. So how does a bid manager cope up to this exciting yet challenging task? Would you mind repeating that question? Somehow I didn't quite follow it. Yeah, so the expectation from a solution architect and a bid manager are very similar now in IT field. So how does a bid manager should cope up with this exciting yet challenging task? A bit manager and a solution architect. Solution architect, yes. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, so according to me, at least at this point of time, uh, these are separate roles. Uh, and pretty much uh, in the previous question itself, Sam has emphasized the difference between a bid manager and a proposal manager. So we clearly know what a bid manager is supposed to do. A solution architect is uh, forms a part of the entire bid and is responsible for just one component of the entire bid itself and not the entire uh, proposal, you know, like a bid manager itself. Uh, so I would still say that the roles are pretty different. Uh, for a solution architect, one really needs to be a, a deep technical person itself. For example, if it's a web-based solution, you need to know a, a lot about the different technologies that have been used. Um, if it's APIs or any other kind of uh, interconnections that are being used in the solution, the bid manager is not expected to know all of that. What the bid manager would be expected to know uh, is, is probably at a high level, th this is the kind of a solution. It's a web-based solution. It's a three-tier solution. But uh, the deep part of it that comes in what we were referring to uh, is more from the solution architect. Very well said. So I think that probably a question came uh, along, I'm thinking, because, you know, we talked about the rising expectations and demands of, of yes. that we are placing on, on proposal. They, they need to be Superman. They should do everything. But I think that's within within reason and within, you know, common sense, I suppose, right? I suppose. But good. Thank you. Rupesh, next question, please. So next question is from Girish Tech Chandani. And his question is that as IT and associated services are dynamic in nature and always evolving, so is it fair to comment that buyers will continue to look forward to sellers playing the path guider? Sam is rubbing his hands. So. Just, 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 just to be clear, repeat that question because it's an important question. Let's go ahead and repeat it. So as, a, as IT and associated services are dynamic in nature and always evolving, so is it fair to comment that buyers will continue to uh, guide the sailors. I mean, they, they continue to play as a path guider to the sailors. Pretty profound question, Sam. So I think um, the reality is if somebody wants you to win in the client organization, 
there will be official and unofficial mentor and coach, right? Um, we've all experienced that where we have a bit of naivety at times and we know that the person wants us, they believe in us and the solution our company can bring and they're coaching us. Whereas if they don't want us to win, it'll always be follow the process. Oh. <laughs> I see. All right. And, and there's an old, old jungle saying, and I'm <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, for an incumbent, if there is an RFP has come out, you've already lost the RFP. Hmm. That's, that's, that's an interesting one. That's a deep one. That's a deep one. Good. So, you know, I think uh, with that, uh, if Rupesh, if you're okay with it, I think we are... I think we have a two small questions so we could... Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Please go ahead. So, from Gaurav Kumar Sarma, he said that he's asking that could bid management professional will also be a propos proposal manager and content manager? And what are the current tools to improve bid management skill? Uh, bid management skill, that's it. Yeah. Sam, write down your alley. Well, I mean, the thing is, we can all be all-rounders, okay? But if we should start looking at a putting a proposal and a bid together as a, as a production play, you know, think of it as a show. And in the show, Amitabh Bachchan could have five roles. But, you know, then what happens when both the roles have to be at the same place? Is the double coming in there? So, so whilst we have to have knowledge and we may have skills, on each bid, we should have a racy and clarity to say, which one of our team is performing the role of a bid manager? Who is performing the role of a proposal manager? Who's performing the role of solution architect? Even if I ex experience this, we can do all of those roles. It's that lack of clarity means, I'm assuming you're do doing the price Oh, no, I assumed you're playing the role of solution architect. So that clarity should be there from one bid to next. Ashish? No, I think you pretty much answered it, Sam. So. And the second last question of the day is that what is the first section that we should look into while writing a response? So I'll give you guys a break for one second. Let me, let me jump out and answer that. And you're welcome to contradict me. Okay. So I think this is, I'm reading it as from Mukta, I think, right? Mukta. Well, I would like to say something which, you know, may be controversial here, but what are the first section? Let me just, I hope I understood this. The first section, in my personal opinion, is a draft, a draft executive summary. I don't know if you call that a section, but in my mind, that ought to be the first thing you start putting it together as the foundation from which the rest of the proposal will evolve. It will be a living document that has to be revisited again and again and again. But in my opinion, that's the guiding guide, you know, the lighthouse from which the rest, rest of the proposal emerges. So I'm looking forward to being, you know, that con confirmed or contradicted by either of our panel. Ashish, I'll be friend. confirming that because that was pretty much the answer I was about to give. Apart from the fact that uh, uh, this next part that I'm going to say logically does not form part of the uh, proposal or the solution response itself. But... Uh, what I would say is the first activity that really needs to be done is bid qualification. Uh, if there is no good bid qualification process in place, then you may go ahead and answer any section one they want to, but doesn't make sense. If there is a good bid qualification process in place, uh, the organization wants to take it forward, then definitely, yes, the base executive summary should be the first section. So in addition to that, and I totally agree with the idea that an exec summary is sort of uh, puts the strategy. But what I would also say, start with the evaluation criteria. Yes. But before you even do anything, start with the evaluation criteria. How am I going to be measured that I reach up to it? And then start with a compliance matrix. Those are the two things you need to do is to first create that entire evaluation criteria and say, can we meet it? And can we articulate it? I'll give you an example, talking about incumbents. There was a, in the UK, there was a public sector um, rebid happening because by law they have to rebid. And the customer wanted the incumbent to stay there. That was absolutely crystal clear. They, we, don't want to, we don't want to lose this. But the incumbent lost. And you know why the incumbent lost? Because in the RFP or the tender, there was a section called transition. 
and the incumbent team said, well, this doesn't apply to us. We're incumbent. Who, what are we going to do with transition? What the incumbent team didn't see is that that had about 40 marks to give on the evaluation criteria. How much of, and so when they wrote, they wrote in there saying not applicable as we are incumbents. What evaluation, how much do you think they scored out of the 40? Zero. And that was the main reason they lost because of that one section. So I would say start with the evaluation criteria, even if we are the incumbent, to see we don't get low scorings. Perfect. Thank you. So, Rupesh, I think we are... Uh, I think the last question of the day is, uh, is came from a Purva Singh. That okay. is the future of bidding and proposal writing. What changes can we as a bidding expert do to update ourselves and stay relevant to the field? Any particular particular skill? And this uh, and a relevant question was from Niraj Trivedi as well. Uh, what do you think of Grammarly as a tool uh, when you, you know, uh, writing a proposal? Also, I don't know. Uh, I hope we covered the first question in the first question we did right. cover. So, so, yeah. We so did and, cover and anytime, Apoor, you, you see a challenge, watch a rerun of this particular. Yes, we, we've spoken about it in some depth. Now, as far yeah, as the but that's on the lighter note, but uh, yes. the, the two or three points that uh, Sam mentioned, I mentioned, Abhijit Da put in his inputs as well. <laughs> Stay relevant, keep learning, and recognize the fact that it's a strategic role and not an operational role. Yes, that's that's very important. And, and as far as the tools are concerned, yes, I think you know Grammarly is 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 obviously whether it's Grammarly today or something else tomorrow. I think it would be silly and naive of us, no matter how well we think we write, no matter how well we think we articulate, if we don't use tools, you know, it, it is not a good, it is not a very smart thing to do because we all make mistakes, whether it's grammar, spelling, poor construction, poor articulation, active, passive voice, we all bungle up all the time. Sam, I think you agree. So therefore, if you if you if if Grammarly is your tool of choice, the one that you enjoy, et cetera, et cetera, I would say go ahead. Tomorrow things will probably get better and better, right? So yes, I'm I'm all for tools uh, in in the in the use of the creation of proposals. Sam, anything? Also, if I may, um, please. I think there's there's a whole bunch of tools, and I'm not an expert on tools. So okay. you know, I'm not an expert on Grammarly or any of the other tools. But the one thing I've learned, just last night, I was doing a proposal, I reviewed it, and there was one word I typed, pasted, I pasted, I'm telling you this, one word I pasted was American spelling, hmm. right? And when I ran the spell check, it picked up that American spelling. So oh, I think what I we need to think about is those kind of things. The tool is only as good as the settings. And we need to have some appreciation. Another one that really gets me is that in French, you you always have a space between of for a question before a question mark or an ah, exclamation. I didn't know but that. in British English you don't. Hmm. And we make that mistake quite often where we hmm. put a space before question mark or a space before exclamation. And yet hmm. in French, that is normal. So we need to think about these kind of things and have build our general knowledge. Yeah. And then yeah. tools can be most effective because sometimes, you know, the tool can say it's okay, but it itself could be wrong. <laughs> okay, all right. Fantastic. So, you know, I think we had a great time and I want to thank the two of you for a fantastic discussion and, you know, sharing your insights. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you so much, Ashish. It's great thank to have you guys here. And of course, all the attendees who've been here. I'm sorry if we couldn't answer some of your questions, but you can be assured that we will be uh, doing many more such programs quite often. So you should look forward to seeing us, uh, you know, some more announcements for that. So again, in, in, respect, in regard to that, please once again, do subscribe to APNP, uh, the, uh, the LinkedIn page, the Instagram page. That's a lot of fun going to happen over the Instagram stuff. So take a look there. And of course, YouTube, This even this program will be on YouTube, uh, you know, fairly soon. So with that, I want to come to a close. Uh, if you have any questions, please write in to, uh, you know, to, to Rupesh. He will convey that to us and we'll be in touch with you. Please connect with all of us, me, Simon, Ashish, on LinkedIn as personal connects. All right? Absolutely. So thank you so much. Thank you. Rupesh. Thank you very much, Vasu and Ashish. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And please do submit your feedback uh, through our survey questions. Please do.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.